Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, Understanding Rust Program Requirements. Please note that all audience audio connections are currently in listen-only mode. You may submit content-related questions using the Q&A panel located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And of course, we welcome everybody to use the chat panel to check in and let us know where you're coming from. All right, and there will be an opportunity to ask verbal questions at the end of the presentation. We'll give you instructions on how to unmute yourself at that time. All right, and with that, I will turn the call over to Michael Simmons, Ross Program Manager. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, again, my name is Michael Simmons and want to wish everyone a good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, and just want to say we are extremely, extremely excited about today's presentation. Um, this is our uh, renewed effort, um, renewed effort to really try to have regular sessions with you. We want to connect with you in the field. We want to understand uh, what some of your challenges are. And even more importantly, uh, we want to give you resources to help you run and implement your Ross program successfully. Um, I should say um, just a little bit of context of today's um, presentation. Of course, understanding program um, requirements um, is the title. Um, but the purpose is to really help our FY23 grantees, right? A lot of the information that we're going to cover today is going to be tailored for FY23 uh, grantees. But not to worry, if you are a previous Ross grantee, please feel free to, to, to stick around, to stay. Uh, we're going to have, of course, as Marilyn said, questions and answers. We're asking you to put your uh, questions in the um, question and answer feature. Um, and we want to start with you telling us in the chat feature uh, where you're from. And we'll be, of course, monitoring that throughout. So we want to know where you're from, your Ross program, and you can put the name um, as well as um, the state that you're um, you know, calling in from or joining us from. So I think that's a little bit of the context. Again, um, really want to focus on uh, FY23 grantees. If you are a previous Ross grantee, not to worry. Uh, some of the information here may not necessarily touch on uh, what you uh, can do in your program, particularly as it relates to who you can serve. Uh, but nonetheless, there will be enough general information here um, that everyone will be able to benefit from. So um, with that, I would like to... Um, give my colleagues an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, we have a number of individuals on the call. Uh, so Lewis, I'll start with you uh, and giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, Michael. Um, so my name is Lewis Storman and along with Michael, I'm one of the Ross program managers. Um, you might know me from debriefings or uh, mm -hmm. appeals or, or running the competition, but uh, that's been one of my main um, duties as a Ross program manager, managing the FY23 competition. Yep. And uh, I don't know if Dina is was able to join us, but Jessica and Gerald and, and Trey, please feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, hello, um, my name is Jessica O'Neill and I am one of the uh, Ross program supports here. So I'm happy to join you in um, you might have seen me on some email correspondence. So, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Jessica. And Gerald and Trey. Hi, I'm Gerald Bennett, and I uh, work with the uh, Ross team. I'm uh, uh, working the uh, Community Support Services uh, Division. Thanks, Gerald. I think Hello, I saw I'm Trey. I'm the CSS Deputy Director. Yep. And Janelle and Daquan, Daquan, I know you were having some uh, trouble with your mic earlier, um, but I didn't know if Janelle or uh, Daquan, if you have you had your mic uh, situation uh, taken care of. Hey, Michael, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. Hey, Janelle. Hi, so I'm Janelle Johns. I am the National Grant Manager for OFA, which is the Office of Foot Operations at HUD headquarters, which Daquan Wright also work alongside me. We're pretty much the liaison for the field office representatives and between the Ross program managers that's on this call. 
So really wanted to give you a chance to meet the Ross team, right? These are the individuals here in the um, main office, and we're here to support you. We are really interested in providing you with information, resources that you need to run a successful Ross program. So thanks, team, for the introductions. And now to get into our agenda. We, I think we have a pretty packed agenda. Um, part of what we wanted to do with this session is, you know, continue to give you an overview of your Ross grant. Um, we wanted to talk about um, eligible funds for um, um, use in your Ross program, uh, expectations of the service coordinator, um, and who can be served in important dates to remember and then next steps. Um, one of the things that you will constantly hear us uh, really emphasize during today's training is just how important it is uh, to us that you get off to a fast start with your Ross program. So we want to make sure you have the fundamentals as well as um, some in-depth understanding of your Ross program. Um, one of the things we wanted to do with today's presentation is that we wanted to be as interactive as possible. Um, so with that, we have some polling questions. So our first polling question is, we want to know about you. Um, can you let us know if you are a renewal or a new Ross grant, and uh, Marilyn, I think, has put the poll up. Um, and this is really focusing on our FY23 grantees. We wanna know who you are um, and your status with the Ross program. So gonna take a couple seconds to um, allow you to respond to the poll. In another five seconds for you to respond. Marilyn, do you mind uh, showing the results? Okay. Uh, All right. Are you able to view them? Yeah, I think we may have uh, got our answers a little bit mixed up. So I, I'm taking a 79% is probably a new, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, renewal sites. Um, and the 14 is new. Okay, got it. Thanks for that. So next, we wanted to get into an overview of the Ross program. Um, I know some of you have probably attended uh, some sessions in the past, and you've probably seen this, um, but the Ross program is designed to assist residents um, in Indian public housing, as well as RAD, PBB, and PBRA um, property, converted properties to help residents make progress towards economic and housing self-sufficiency. Um, this is done by removing educational and professional barriers that residents face. Um, much of what the Ross program is, is the main, a, a large part of the function is case management, right? And this is where the service core. Okay, it looks like we have lost Michael's connection. Michael, can you hear us? Um, are you able to sh uh, put back up the slides and we'll continue from here? Okay, yes, I can. One moment. Thank you. You're um, welcome. So uh, as Michael was saying, and I think he's back now, but- Yeah, Trey, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, let me share. I, I, I'm so no, sorry. You're sharing the screen. It's already on. Okay. Yep. Yep. So um, so program challenges, um, there is, you know, opportunity for you to um, really think about um, how you can use the program to support um your residents. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
So and, and think about the Ross program, right? Um, as I mentioned, you know, residents are going to come with a number of challenges, right? And part of what we're really excited about with the Ross program is that um, you have a number of unique tools to support your residents. Um, part of what we wanted to do with the Ross program is to give you the flexibility you need to be supportive in residents coming to you who have a number of different challenges. Um, these challenges can be everything from criminal justice involvement uh, to elderly, disabled. And the Ross program is really unique, particularly as it relates to um, other um, you know, HUD programs that you may have, particularly FSS and Jobs Plus. Um, in the case of Ross, you know, we're not restricted to work eligible adults. Uh, gives you opportunity to work with a wide range of community members. Um, and it also gives you the flexibility, right, to devise interventions to help support your residents. One of the things that we really are um, really want to emphasize with, particularly with our new grantees, FY23, is for you to think about some of the unique aspects of the Ross program, right? Starting with your community needs assessment. Uh, the community needs assessment was your opportunity to tell us what challenges, services you need. And it gives you an opportunity to ultimately devise services over a three-year grant period. And that uniqueness is really a strength of the Ross program and really something that we encourage you to take advantage of. Uh, next slide. So in thinking about some of the core functions of the Ross program, I mentioned the resident needs assessment. Um, the resident needs assessment is so important because this is something that you did even before you were funded. Um, this is your community needs assessment. We have some, you know, I think important provisions there in terms of helping you uh, survey your residents. And ultimately that information was given to you and you sent to us. And it really gives you a platform, a foundation, if you will, in terms of understanding what services and uh, needs your residents have. Um, the other aspect of the Ross program was, you know, partnerships um, building, right? Like when you submitted your grant, you, we ask you to include a 25% match, right? These partners are individuals who pledge to support you over your three-year grant period. And it's so important for you to continue to rely on these individuals and to go back to them uh, to give you the support that they have committed to your Ross program. Next slide. I've kind of talked about um, case management, right? So case, case management is really at the core of the work of the service coordinator. Um, the case management gives you an opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with residents, um, doing an intake assessment, understanding what uh, referral services they need, and to, again, going back to your partners, think about how you can work with your local community partners, including those who've given you a commitment of a 25% match to your grant, as well as other local um, community providers um, to help you uh, implement services and give support to residents. Uh, community engagement, um, very important to the Ross program, right? It's so important for you to understand um, who your residents are, and even more importantly, it's important for them to know who you are, right? So part of that resident engagement is thinking about how you can reach a wide range of residents. How can you find them and how can you ensure they can find you? Um, part of what we've experienced in the Ross program is that uh, so many times there are resources that um, grantees can tap into um, to really begin to um, understand how to find residents in need, how to ensure residents in need are able to connect with them. And we'll talk about a little bit of that um, in this presentation today. Uh, next slide. And lastly, uh, evaluation and reporting, right? Um, part of what evaluation does is not only does it give us an opportunity to understand how um, supportive um, the Ross program has been in moving residents along the continuum of self-sufficiency, but even more importantly, um, as a Ross program. Um, it's something that you can reflect on to understand how well you're doing, right? So that can be everything from um, doing surveys with residents to understand what services you're providing are most um, beneficial, um, doing surveys to ask residents what their needs are, and ultimately being able to understand how well you're implementing your Ross program. Reporting, um, uh, as you know, uh, coming up in October uh, 30th is reporting deadline. 
Um, we're going to do um, several trainings or at least one training in August on reporting um, because we really want you to understand uh, your annual reporting, why it is important, uh, what are some of the um, um, reporting uh, KPIs, uh, key performance indicators um, that is important for you to report on. And we really want you to get off again to a very strong start, just overall with the implementation of your Ross grant, but even um, importantly, uh, with the October 30th date coming up, um, also with reporting for your Ross grant. So next, Marilyn, I want to move to the next um, um, polling question. Um, so the next polling question is on a scale of one to five, how confident do you feel in your ability to implement your Ross program? Uh, we want to know um, just uh, how confident you are. We use this to measure uh, over time um, the supports that we're giving, as well as, um, you know, touching bases with you about additional resources that you may need. Um, with this polling question, we're asking that you answer this polling question here. Um, but also use the chat um, to talk about or to let us know any additional uh, supports that you feel you can use to uh, be successful in implementing your Ross program. So the polling question is here, but also use the chat to let us know if there are additional um, programs, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, presentations or trainings that you would like in order to feel more successful. So Marilyn, I think we can give it five more seconds and then we can show the results. So uh, for those, again, uh, slightly uh, confident, um, please let us know. Uh, use the uh, chat to let us know um, what we can do to definitely support you as well as moderately uh, so uh, confident. We're so happy and pleased to see the very confident, extreme confident um, in terms of implementing your Ross program. And again, we want to continue to provide supportive services for you um, in order to um, ensure that you remain confident and also increase your level of confidence in terms of implementing your ROS program. So we can go to the next slide. So now we want to make a transition and think about um, eligible use of funds for your ROS program. Um, again, this is something that's very important to us. Um, because we really want to make sure that you are not only staying in compliance with your grant, but just as importantly, that you're using your funds in a way that's going to maximize um, the impact that you can have in your community. Uh, next slide. So for the Ross program, um, three budget line items, uh, salary uh, and fringe benefits, uh, training and travel related to professional development and program development and administrative uh, costs. So three um, 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 budget line items, but they are very important, very powerful in terms of you being able to implement a successful uh, Ross program. Here, in terms of thinking about salary and fringe, one of the things that we really want to emphasize is that um, you, we really want you to pay your Ross service co coordinator um, the amount that you were funded for. Right, like we went through a very elaborate process of determining. Um, uh, the salary and fringe for your service coordinator. And we really want all programs to honor what you were funded for in terms of paying your Ross coordinator. We feel that that's important for several reasons. One is that it gives you an opportunity to use all your funds in this category to support your Ross coordinator. And two, um, we've seen at least anecdotal evidence um, that some programs are actually paying their Ross coordinator less than what they were funded for. And this can be problematic, particularly as it relates to being able to maintain um, um, your Ross coordinator, right? We don't want to uh, lose Ross coordinators because they're going on to other jobs that pay more, uh, particularly when programs aren't uh, paying their Ross coordinator what they uh, were funded for. Uh, travel and training, again, it goes back to retention, similar to uh, salary. Um, travel and training costs is really important in terms of uh, being able to build the um, 
uh, capacity of your raw service coordinator. It gives your service coordinator opportunity to learn more about their profession. It also is an important tool, again, to retain, right? Everyone wants to be in position and on a job where they can get professional development. So we really encourage you uh, to use your training and travel dollars as it relates to that. Um, and lastly, administrative costs, right? Administrative costs is a very important tool that you have in your Ross program. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to um, help um, grantees along a continuum of needs as it relates to their ability for self-sufficiency. And we're going to go into that a little bit more uh, in this presentation. So next slide. Again, uh, it, it, you know, emphasize this uh, salary and fringe, want you to pay what you were funded for based on your application. And two, uh, for training and travel costs, you can get up to 2,500 per year per service coordinator. So you can really see how that can help you in terms of uh, providing professional development for your Ross coordinator. There are some stipulations. One is that all training and travel costs must be pre-approved by the local field office or area ONAP which means basically that prior to using this fund, you need to uh, reach out to your field office, ONAP rep, uh, multifamily rep, and let that person uh, know that you wanna do training and they will give you approval for training. And there are some important things to keep in mind. One, uh, you should be asking to use these funds prior to the training itself, right? You can't have a training and then come back after the training and ask for approval, that can be grounds for you, uh, your funding request to be denied. Um, and we're going to give you some additional, you know, um, supportive uh, information as relates to using your training and travel costs, um, you know, moving forward, because it's really something that's very important in terms of giving you a chance to uh, utilize important aspects of your grant. Uh, next slide. Um, so I mentioned administrative costs, right? Like it's really an important tool in your uh, Ross toolbox, right? Administrative um, costs can help fund things such as removing barriers for active um, Ross participants. So everything from a bus pass um, to um, fees for, um, you know, um, various testing, educational testing. Um, it's really a chance for you to think about um, Ross participants, individuals coming in, needing help, and having um, important costs related to their ability for self-sufficiency, right? So um, just real quick, I'm thinking about transportation, right? Um, individuals may need access to a bus pass for a job interview, right? Your uh, administrative cost gives you opportunity to uh, support those Ross programs. And it gives you a chance to kind of think about what are my need, what are the needs of my residents and give you, you an opportunity to think about um, how you can be flexible in giving them that support. Um, and it's really important tool. So never forget, right? Administrative costs gives you an opportunity to remove barriers for active Ross participants, right? Remember, a, a Ross participant is someone who has had an intake assessment through your Ross program. And now you can begin to help this person um, with um, some important barriers that they may face in terms of moving towards self-sufficiency. Uh, next slide. So similar to administrative costs, right? Um, direct services is an important tool um, that you can use in your program. Um, so we really want to make sure that we are emphasizing direct services, right? So direct services, one, should be tied to your community needs assessment, right? So this is something that was done uh, when you were submitting your, um, uh, your application to HUD. You did a needs assessment. You told us what your areas of need um, would be for your Ross program. So direct services should be tied to your needs assessment. Um, two, and the second thing to uh, really emphasize is that um, direct services should be used in the absence of local partners being able to fulfill the need of active Ross participants, right? So we really wanted to um, introduce direct services in the Ross program um, several years back, in part because we know some communities are in rural areas, areas, some communities are in areas where there are not a lot of uh, local partners and supportive um, um, services that you can provide. So direct services is an opportunity for you to help overcome some of those barriers, um, particularly as it relates to lack of childcare, after school programming and uh, job training. Uh, next slide. So in thinking about what you can do 
um, with your direct services. This is not meant to be exhaustive, but just really something to kind of get you to start thinking about um, the possibilities associated with direct services, right? So child care services, it can provide a bridge funding to help Ross participants cover initial child care um, costs um, up to eight weeks to eliminate various employment, job training, education. Um, like there are some Ross programs, you have residents that are in need of educational programming, right? There may not be a local partner that can provide GED training. Um, so you can use this to um, begin to think about how you can implement educational services um, to your residents. Um, there are some um, important stipulations. Um, we ask um, that um, when you're using these funds, that you contact the Ross office first, us at headquarters, and we have our uh, email address um, at the end of the slide, uh, as well as, um, um, you know, we can put it also in the chat. But direct services, again, it's a um, bridge to help you think about how you can help residents who are in need of services, particularly when there's not a local partner there to provide these services. And the second thing is very important to remember is that it needs to be tied to your needs of assessment, your needs assessment. And lastly, you know, we ask that you reach out to us to um, get pre-approval um, to think about um, using your direct services. Next slide. So, we talked about um, use of Ross funding, um, but wanted to like just spend a moment to think about um, what are some ineligible uses and kind of what can happen um, if you're using um, Ross funds um, in a way that's ineligible. Um, one, I um, want to start with uh, ineligible activities. Uh, so funds may not be used for any activities other than a salary and fringe of Ross um, service coordinator, um, related administrative costs and training and travel for the Ross coordinator, right? Your uh, funds may not be used for the salary of a uh, FSS coordinator or any other uh, general staff. Um, and we really kind of spell a lot of this out in the NOFO, um, but really think about using your funds to support um, Ross program um, um, service coordinator, um, and really think about um, what we've discussed with administrative costs, training and travel, right? Training and travel, it's important to remember that in order to um, use that, it needs to be pre-approved by your field office, ONAP office, or multifamily um, office representative, and two, uh, it needs to happen prior to, right? Um, with uh, funds for salary and fringe, it's important to one, pay your uh, service coordinator, um, what you were funded for, and two, um, it can be used um, for general staff if they're not doing Ross-related work. Um, and if there is a case, and we hope this is not uh, going to happen, but if there is a case where there's any ineligible use of funds, um, upon review, review um, HUD may determine that the funds will need to be uh, will need to be repaid. Um, so we don't want to um, put anyone in that position um, to have to re um, um, pay funds for ineligible usage. Next slide. So next, we want to make a transition to thinking about expectations of your service coordinator, right? Um, I mentioned that the service coordinator, in many regards, in many regards, is the engine of the Ross program, right? The service coordinator is the person that many times is going to be at the forefront of your program, meeting with residents, residents are going to know who this person is. And um, the service coordinator really, as we you know mentioned in previous slides, has a lot of flexibility in terms of supporting uh, community residents. Uh, next slide. So one of the things with the uh, service coordinator is that it's just really opportunity to be reflective on your Ross application. Um, so much of the Ross program actually happened before you were funded, right? We ask that you do a community needs assessment. Um, based on your community needs assessment, um, you tell us what your areas of need um, would be. Um, but part of that community needs assessment also gives you an opportunity to have a baseline understanding of your community, right? Like, so what's happening as it relates to health, education, financial literacy, um, 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 elderly, disabled services, re-entry, digital inclusion, what's happening in your community in terms of where residents are? Based on your needs assessment, you can draw a lot of understanding 
on where they're, um, what the needs are. And you can begin to think about, okay, how am I not only going to work in these areas of need that you told us are important to your community, but think about how you want to move the needle in terms of having an impact on your community. Um, based on your areas of need, again, they are very important because they play a major role later in your reporting. Um, with reporting, we're going to do, again, some training and, and webinars on reporting. Um, but based on your areas of need, um, you have specific KPIs, right? They're key performance indicators that you um, are being asked to report on. And it really gives us an understanding based on your areas of need, how are you moving the needle in terms of supporting your residents? Lastly, in thinking about activities you're planning to move residents towards self-sufficiency, um, the baseline gives you an opportunity to kind of think about your case management plan, right? Um, when you think about your uh, case management, um, when you're working with residents one-on-one, -on -one, based on the intake assessment, um, kind of how do you want to support that particular resident over uh, time, right? So year one, year two, and year three, um, how do you want to be able to support that resident and their goals related to self-sufficiency, right? So some examples that you can think about, right? Think about like the X number of residents when you think about your case management file um, that you want to see have fewer barriers to employment, right? Uh, X percent percent increase in the number of residents who have seen a primary doctor, right? So we want you to really kind of think about your uh, needs assessment broadly, right? How do you want to understand the baseline of your community um, and what the needs of your residents are? And then we want you to think narrowly and thinking about, okay, now I am providing case management to individual residents. What are the goals that you have for those residents um, over a three-year period, right? Like, what are some goals that you and that resident can have in terms of where they want to be um, how they want to um, begin to interact with the Ross program, what they need from the Ross program, and ultimately, how can you move them towards um, self-sufficiency? So broadly is the community needs assessment, and more specifically is your case management um, intake assessments to allow you to think about how you want to support your residents. Uh, next slide. So in thinking about uh, your Ross service coordinator, right? Um, and we talked about uh, engagement for residents, right? Like, like what's your community strategy to recruit residents um, to your Ross program? Um, how are you attracting? How are you marketing? Um, some of the things that we've you know, found and heard from previous grantees is that you know, it's important to describe the incentives offered by the Ross program, right? Like, why should someone join? Like, what are the potential benefits of um, the Ross program? It's important to be accessible to residents, right? Like, they should know how to contact you, including your phone number, and being able to have direct understanding of who you are and how they can reach you and how you can ultimately help them. Um, it's important to you know, think about residents, not only as individuals in need of service, but also as partners, right? Um, resident council meetings may be a really important opportunity for you to uh, reach residents. Uh, resident leaders may help you promote your Ross program. Um, you may continue to you know, um, like do surveys with residents to think about what are the needs of community residents? Are you meeting those needs? Uh, and these are all things that you can think about when you want to recruit, publicize, and ultimately bring Ross participants into the fold and ultimately give you an opportunity to reach them and ultimately for you to uh, partner with your residents in terms of moving them towards self-sufficiency. So next slide. So there are some specific um, case management requirements, right? Um, we expect you to assess the needs, need of, needs of uh, residents, um, provide one-on-one -on -one case management. Um, but really, one of the things that is important to emphasize is HUD expects there to be a 50 to 1 client to Ross service coordinator uh, ratio per year for your grant, right? Uh, we ask that you um, provide services um, to um, service to residents, and you should have a caseload of 50. 
Um, we do know that there's some new grantees coming aboard. So for October reporting, it's not 50 for you, but we ask within a year uh, that you get up to that 50 to one ratio, right? That you should have a caseload of um, 50 residents for each Ross service coordinator that you have. And ultimately, um, um, at the six months, um, you know, of the launch, you know, you should be serving that um, 50 uh, uh, number of, of residents, right? So we ask that you, as fast as possible, get up to speed to be able to serve those 50 um, to one ratio of Ross, Ross service coordinator to um, residents that you're serving through your Ross program. Next slide. Uh, can you go back more? Yep, yeah, thanks. Um, so tracking uh, program outcomes with Ross reporting. Um, again, I talked about your needs assessment and key performance indicators. Um, the KPIs are, are specific, quantifiable, and it gives you an opportunity to think about um, how you're reporting, how you're helping residents. And ultimately, that information goes back to us through um, um, October reporting, and then we use that information to update our Ross data dashboard, which we're in the process of updating now. Um, and we'll be providing you with um, the webinars in terms of um, reintroducing you um, in, in some cases to the Ross dash, um, data dashboard and giving you an opportunity to understand how your reporting is reflected in the data dashboard, and even more specifically, how your key performance indicators are um, showing how well you're doing in terms of working with residents. Um, again, um, we're going to you know, really do a, a heavy push on reporting um, because it's very important for us to be able to understand program outcomes and how well you are working with residents to move them towards uh, self-sufficiency. Next slide. So I, I, I kind of briefly touched on um, working with partners and tracking your match, right? Um, so um, at the start of your grant application, you were able to secure a 25% match. Um, and it's very important for you to uh, go back to those partners now that you've received your Ross um, grant um, to remind them both of their commitments to you, as well as for you all to kind of think about a plan of action. Uh, to leverage um, the resources that your partners have uh, that they pledge to you and how you can ultimately think about a strategy to support community residents. Uh, next slide. 25% match, you know, I touched on that again. Uh, it's, you know, really want you to kind of think about um, what that is, who they are, and how they can help you with your residents. Next slide. So reporting, I'm just going to touch on a few things here. Um, you know, uh, reporting, we're going to do some, as I mentioned before, some trainings there. So uh, ways to report, uh, Excel template, um, case management um, um, systems, um, software. Um, and I think it's very important to think about um, not only using software, but also as a reminder, as it relates to your administrative costs, you can actually use your administrative costs to help um, purchase software, uh, case management software, um, which you know ultimately can be used to um, possibly increase um, your ability to uh, report on residents, or at very least, um, give you a you know in some cases a seamless opportunity to support on res uh, residents. So think about administrative costs as it relates to giving you um, access to purchase um, um, case management software. Uh, when you're reporting, um, understand that, you know, it can't be any personal identifiable information. So you have to uh, code information in such a way that you're not including anyone's name, social security number, or any other uh, information that can identify them, their address, um, that their reporting can't be identified with a particular person. Um, lastly, what I'll say here is um, please understand that uh, reporting due dates, um, um, October 30th, um, and not so much for this uh, cohort because you have three years for this, but your final report, uh, we wanted to remind you is due um, 120 days after your three year grant cycle. So um, that's way down the line, but your reporting for October 30th is coming up. 
and we wanted to make sure that you are reminded of that. So next slide. So next we're going to go to a polling question. Um, I've mentioned several times uh, in this presentation areas of need, right? Um, so we want to just ask a polling question. Um, do you know your areas of need um, that you know were identified in your community needs assessment? So I'm going to take a um, few minutes for you to answer that question. So another five minutes. Um, do you know your areas of need that were identified in your community needs assessment that you um, presented to HUD? So I think we can go ahead and present the answers. Great. Um, for those who are uh, answering no or not sure, um, we can provide you with that information. Um, so um, you can request from us uh, your needs assessment, um, your areas of need, I'm sorry, um, as well as if you, anyone on the call um, would like access to their grant application, right? It's something that ideally you will have um, access to, um, particularly given that you send it to HUD, so it's there in your um, local agency. But if you want that information, we can um, provide you with your um, grant application for you to understand your needs assessment, as well as um, provide you some direct information for uh, your areas of need. Um, and you can reach out to HUD. I have the, um, the email um, at the end of this presentation, as well as you can um, put it in the chat um, and just give us your information in terms of if you need um, access to your uh, areas of need. So next slide. So I've, I've gone over this, um, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, I know we're running uh, tight on time, so these are important dates to remember. Uh, next slide. Um, so next we wanted to go into who you can serve through your Ross program. Uh, and again, so, this is, yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, because we have a, a ton of questions off of what you already presented, and I think um, maybe we can get to some of those questions. <clears throat> sure. Yes. Um, um, so, and I think that would be helpful for everyone. Uh, and so you guys know there's about 35 questions uh, that we received through the chat box. And there's also several in the, sorry, in the Q&A portion, as well as in the chat box. So, um, I'll start off answering a few, and maybe if we run out of time, Michael, we can include some of this stuff in our next webinar. Sure, yeah. So uh, one of the questions is, uh, does a Ross coordinator have to follow the same rules as the PHA that they work for, such as asking about medical issues during your assessment, so you know what type of jobs they may be able to do, et cetera? Yep. So um, you don't have to ask uh, in terms of Ross um, expectations. You don't, but your intake assessment should give you an opportunity to understand um, what the needs are for your residents. And ultimately, it should give you a, a broad understanding of how you can support them in that process. Right. So um, we can um, we're in the process of developing some um, intake assessment tools. But even more specifically, um, your reporting to Ross is going to address your KPIs. Um, we have a data um, guidebook that directs you to understand what your um, um, areas of needs are related to your KPIs. So ultimately, you should be asking some questions that's going to allow you to report on um, Ross um, residents particularly as it relates to your um, reporting requirements. Um, so okay. two things. One is that you don't necessarily have to follow um, the you know, questions of your PHA as it relates to what Ross is asking for, but even more specifically, we're asking for you to 
um, be able to gather information from ROS participants as it relates to um, ROS reporting specifically. Got you. And just to add to that question really quickly, uh, so yes, you should follow the same rules as your PHA, meaning you guys have policies in place for how you're to handle certain questions, especially around health related questions. Um, so uh, you should definitely follow what your PHA is saying um, around that, especially to make sure that's in compliance with HIPAA laws um, uh, and fair housing laws as well. Uh, one of the, another question is, we have accepted the grant, but funds are not available in ELOCs. Do you know when they will be made available? So I know we have uh, Lewis and Jessica on the line. Uh, do you have any insight? Yeah, our um, one thing, our basic language right now is that our goal is to have it out to you by the end of the month, but it's usually standard to probably wait um, a few months between, unfortunately, for your grant. But our goal is to try to get it to you before the end of the month. So as if you just can go ahead and make sure your NOA uh, gets signed, um, we can go ahead and um, it could probably start getting processed very soon. So just if it doesn't come in by the end of the month um, after we've sent some things out, just let us know. Okay. Um, another question is, can you explain more about intake needs assessment and ROS participant caseload minimums? Yes. So, uh, and, and I guess 18, feel free to chime in, but uh, in terms of your, uh, we ask that you serve 50 to one, right? So um, the ratio is that for each service coordinator, you should have a caseload of 50 residents that you're working with. And your intake assessment is very important because it's what is done in terms of your case management to determine if a ROS, uh, if a individual is a ROS participant, right? So how we define a participant in the ROS program is that they've had an individual case management assessment um, uh, as part of your case management. So you've uh, given a, 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 a assessment to this resident. You understand what some of their needs are. And based on that, that individual becomes a ROS participant and you can begin to, um, you know, use, you know, particularly as it relates to administrative costs um, to help support that resident towards self-sufficiency and ultimately work with that resident. Got it. Um, great. Um, any recommendations for when residents don't want to complete the intake, but what the support ROS provides? So you can work with residents um, who are non-participants, um, but, you know, just general, so you can give them referrals, you can let them know uh, what opportunities are there. Um, but ultimately, um, the intake assessment is so important because you can do more with that resident. So um, part of marketing and, 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 you know, just hopefully encouraging that resident um, to become a ROS participant and do the intake assessment is that you're able to give that person uh, more so supportive services through your ROS grant. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to, you know, continue to understand what their needs are. And ultimately, um, both through a ROS program and on an individual level, uh, gain a, a greater understanding of the resident needs. Um, and that intake assessment kind of is the tool to kind of help you do that. So one, it gives you opportunity to support the resident, but also gives you opportunity to better understand what some of their needs are. Um, so with that, you know, really encourage you to kind of think about, um, you know, continuing to, to encourage the resident to, to become a ROS participant through the intake assessment. Yep. And I was just say, at, through my own experience with intake assessments, right, no one likes going to the doctor's office and filling out all that paperwork when you first get there, right? That's that type of intake. Um, so I think simplifying the intake may make it better. Um, I, when I was doing, at my last job, having to do intake assessments, um, I made my assessments no more than, for intake, no more than five questions. Um and two of those questions was like name and contact information, right? And that was just a way for me to um, be able to simplify what was uh, that process of, you know, learning what their needs may be um, and making it very simple and even make them feel like they're not actually doing uh, an intake assessment and leaving more rigorous assessments uh, for maybe the second or third visit um, when meeting with a resident. And I would just add that I know there are a lot of questions around intake assessment. So possibly Michael and Jessica 
uh, there should be um, a follow-up, maybe a webinar talking about intake assessments or mm -hmm. some sort of guide or tool. Uh, lots of questions around uh, examples of intake assessments. Where can they find intake assessments? How long should they be? Um, does Ross have an intake assessment? Um, so I would uh, certainly think that would be a good subject to touch um, in the future. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And to your point, Trey, maybe we can kind of, you know, just continue to your point with questions and we can schedule another presentation to kind of follow up on the second half of this. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, more questions are coming in. Is there a plan to have Ross office hours? So it is something that we're looking at implementing. Um, a part of what we want to do is uh, similar to uh, FSS with office hours, but also think about how we can provide content. But I'm just thinking in terms of some of the questions that we're getting, that that may be just an opportunity for us just to have one-on-one -on -one, um, session, not one-on-one, -on -one, but individual uh, sessions that just focus on office hours and questions that individuals may have. So it's you know something that we definitely are, are thinking about and trying to understand how to implement. Uh, another question, must training and travel costs only be used by the Ross coordinator or can a supervisor use it to attend a Ross training as well? That's a good question. Trey, do you have any specific insight there? So I will say that the training dollars are intended for the Ross coordinator. Um, if a supervisor is attending a training for Ross, uh, a Ross training, that may be acceptable. However, uh, the question that HUD may ask is, is do Ross coordinator attending? Uh, because that's really and truly who it's for, is for the person that's actually doing the service coordination. So it will depend. Um, and when submitting your request for training uh, to your HUD local field office, that may be the question that comes up. Um, there was another question. What if your agency's salary range is higher than the grant funds? Um, this is pretty common, right? There's only a certain amount of funds that, um, we're allowed to award, of course, because that's what Congress appropriates. And we're not able to maybe fund folks at what their PHA is paying other staff. And so the, those funds would have to be supplemented from other uh, source accounts. Um, so yes, we've seen that. Um, and yes, that is allowable. So for example, if your uh, coordinator salary is 100,000, uh, because of that's what's comparable to your PHA, their salary and fringe is 100,000, but Ross only pays 80 of that thousand, 20,000 may come from another account and that's uh, totally fine. Um, there's also questions, lots of questions around direct service and the, um, questions around fees. Um, and I guess, Michael, now that we're coming up to time and there's still a ton of questions that's unanswered, uh, do you... No. Yeah, I, I think what we can do is we're in the process of revising our FAQs. So I can take those questions and include it in an FAQ um, and um, develop that and possibly even like think about office hours around FAQs. Yes. Um, there's other questions too on how to accept the award um, as well and um, errors for accepting the award. Mm -hmm. If you are receiving... Um, and have questions around how to accept and where to accept your award, you should email the Ross mailbox at ross-pih at hud.gov. So Trey, what I'll do is to your point, I'll take uh, some of the uh, questions um, and compile those and uh, update our FAQs and think about doing a session once we're able to publish that around FAQs to answer some questions. I know um, we kind of set a time at 2.30 and kind of lost uh, some time, but I, I really wanted to, you know, let sites know that um, this is one of the many sessions that we're gonna continue to have um, and that we are really committed to 
um, providing support to you as you, you know, do this important work and really want to make sure that you're confident in the information that you have and we are responsive to you in terms of additional uh, needs that you may have to support rather than And also to use the Ross mailbox too, if you have any specific, you know, questions that are, uh, you know, needed in a timely fashion, um, we really uh, try to use the mailbox as a way of connecting with residents and providing, um, you know, direct support to them. So with that, Trey uh, team, uh, is there any additional questions last a uh, set of questions that you uh, want to uh, present, uh, Trey or Reed, that we can answer. Uh, and if not, I'll take those questions and um, work on the FAQs to, to include the response to them and get that out to all the Ross programs. Not, uh, not at this time that we can probably answer uh, considering the time, but I do want to say to everyone, thank you for attending uh, this webinar. Um, means a lot and also know that we are going to do a series of webinars and make sure that uh, possibly that we, especially uh, heard the recommendation around the office hours um, like FSS is doing, I think that'll be needed. You guys have a ton of questions and we want to find the, uh, the most smartest way to answer all of those questions and be here for you guys. Um, so thank you once again for attending. Yeah, and, and thank, thank you, you all as well. Yeah. Yeah, I hope to see everyone in, in the near future as we continue to, to provide training and support, you know, supportive services and opportunities to you. So have a great day, everyone. Talk to you soon. All right, that concludes our conference. You may now disconnect. <laughs>